Good morning, Bo Mircha here, Associate Pastor at First President Joliet, and I just love to welcome you into this worship place. As I am recording this, uh, it's Friday morning, and uh, um, I'm not sure if you can hear it. There's a little faint music coming through uh, from the Jezercise group that meets here. And as I'm preparing to do this, you know, I think about being quiet before God and everything else. And then I hear this music and I am reminded that the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Enter his courts, we praise, and with, with lots of music, with a lot of joy and energy. And this is just a reminder to me that God welcomes us in his presence. And in his presence, we find not only joy for our heart, but we find strength to go on another day. So I want to encourage you to be excited, to get you know pumped up and ready for worship because God is ready to meet you. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for everything that you are, for your goodness to us, for the way you come into our lives. We give you thanks, Lord, that as your people, we can call you by your name. And that name to us is Father. So, Lord, bless our time together. Bless the worship we have. Bless the music, the word, the prayers, that they will be food for our souls. And that in, and in doing so, Lord, help us praise you. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, beloved, let us worship. God is with you. So crushed that you can't feel what shame covers up, love reveals it's already here. Now I'm standing in all you've given on earth, but I'm breathing.
Good morning, children. Can you come a little closer? Boy, I feel like it's been a while since I, I, I talked to you uh, for the children time. You know that I like to tell stories, right? You know, I, I like to think about the Bible and then uh, share with you a little story. But for today, I thought that I will try to share my story through pictures. Can you see that? Can you see that over there? It says, from the grave to the sky. It's, it's like a song, right? Well, I have to tell you something a lot about these pictures that I'm going to share with you. You see, when we were looking at learning from the book of Acts, I asked uh, a lady in our congregation, Kim Bolte, to help us put some pictures to the stories. And one of the first stories about Jesus' resurrection, about life, right? If you, if you think about Jesus dying and being on the cross, you'll think, oh, that's the end, right? But now, have you ever watched a butterfly? A, bu a butterfly transforming from a larva into, into a butterfly? It's amazing, right? There's a, a time when the butterfly just turns into a cocoon and you think, that's it. But then transformation happens. And in one way, that captures the life of Jesus and the lives of the believers. Whenever we put our faith in Christ, our lives are transformed just like that. Okay, I have a second picture. Okay. This is one that I really, really like, and it's about the Holy Spirit. You see, when Jesus, before Jesus went to the cross, he talked to his disciples and said, when I'm gone, you're not going to be alone. And then Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, God's presence, God living in us. And in one way, you capture that. Kim was good at capturing that with a dove and with a fire. Because in the book of Acts, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came down and little fires were above people's heads. But the important thing that I, I want to point to you uh, is, you know that God lives in us through his Holy Spirit? When we open our hearts to, to God, He lives in us. He guides us. He leads us through. And what that hap what, when that happens, you know what? This is beautiful. At least I like this one. <coughs> Excuse me. When that happens, you have crowds of people, right? And you start seeing people making a difference. You see these people turning around and looking back? These are people that recognize God and in one way through their lives make a difference to all those around them. You know, God called us to be witnesses. God calls us to be people of faith that share our faith. And sometimes we might think that we make absolutely no difference, right? That we do not make much difference. But when we surrender to God, people can see God in us, in our lives. Remember the Holy Spirit in our lives? God, God does that, right? And then people can see that. Okay, one last picture, and I really like this one. You see, it says over here, surrender and welcome the Holy Spirit. And it's such a beautiful picture. You have the Holy Spirit as a dove, and then you have a person that says, here I am. So, In one way, these pictures, all these four pictures, capture, they tell us what life with God is, right? 
We believe in God. Our lives are transformed. God lives in us, gives us strength to, to be a witness to the world. And all that starts with surrender, with saying, Lord, here I am. I hope you enjoyed the pictures, and I hope that you can say, Lord, use my life for your glory. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your love to us. And we pray, Lord, that we can <coughs> follow you and um, surrender our lives to you. And as we do that, we pray that our lives will be a witness to your love, now and forever. In your name we pray, amen. You have an awesome week. For community updates, uh, I, I, I just got back uh, from uh, uh, dedicating um, the house for a Habitat for Humanity. And uh, it's right down on Rainer Street, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, place. And got to, to meet uh, the family and uh, uh, prayed with the people that were there. And uh, I, I will share a few pictures uh, with that. But I want to uh, to say to you, First Press, and everybody that's been involved in this, what a beautiful, beautiful and uplifting work that is. And it's such an honor, right, to be part of, of a project like that. You know, Habitat for Humanity has uh, uh, been uh, one of those ministries that we support here at First Press. And we are very proud of, of doing that because it really changes lives in a very practical way. So uh, I want to say thank you for all those that are, uh, are involved in that project. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, another build. And uh, Charles, the coordinator for, for the area, just said, you know what, I have your number. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. So I'm sure we're going to find out uh, more news about that. So. Uh, Good, good uh, ministry time. Also, I want to uh, to share with you uh, about um, some of the things that are coming up. Um, 
again, parking lot dinners should be on your calendar first and third Wednesday of the month. Uh, it's, it's a great fellowship time. I always say that. I enjoy it. Uh, and I hope that you can join us for that too. We were also uh, working uh, through all the councils uh, in terms of full reopening and uh, exciting things uh, are going to happen. Uh, our hope is that uh, uh, by September we'll be in full swing with everything happening, but until then everybody and anyone is welcome to, to come on Sunday morning at church and worship in person. We continue to worship at one service, nine o'clock for the summer, but uh, God is good and uh, we continue to, to work together, to be together and to worship together. So that's exciting. Uh, Vacation Bible School is online. If you did not catch up with that, now is the time to do it and the bags are ready to pick up and Sunday School for the children, it's back on, on, uh, on the menu again. Uh, and it's so exciting to be able to, to speak about Sunday school being open because for a year we had no in-person children education. We had Sunday school online, but now the kids can be back together in, in the classroom. So we are really, really happy for, uh, with that. So you guys have an awesome week and uh, let God shine through you. for us to give to this church. Either at the back of the sanctuary, you can mail it in or also online. And the offering isn't just the staff salary or the utility bills, but so much of it is about the ministry, our outreach, our helping those around us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we pray that you bless this offering. We pray that this money be used to touch those in our community who need your touch. And we pray blessings upon this church. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord Master, we, pray, we praise your name all day long. We thank you for your love and goodness. We ask you to bless this reading of your words to all of us. Open up our hearts and our minds to the message that you have for us today. And we give you all the praise and glory and love you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reading today is from the 21st chapter of Genesis verses 1 through 7. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Before we pray, at the end will be the Lord's Prayer, and we will be using the phrases sin and sinners. Let us pray. God of all the world and all of humanity, we lift up those in our area who have lost their homes through the storms recently. I know what it's like not being completely sure where you're going to sleep of losing so many of your possessions. Be with this family, these families. God, I pray that people step up and reach out to them and minister to them in this time of need. God, I pray for this country. I pray for our leaders, local, state, national. And I pray for the end of this virus. I pray that we be safe, that we don't return to normal, but we return to something far beyond it. And I pray for the people gathered here today, those people who are watching online, let them know your touch. Let them know your special love for them. And let us continue in prayer, saying the prayer that the Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Dear Deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not every man? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? 
then why not every man? He delivered Daniel from the lion's den, Jonah from the belly of the whale, and the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, then why not every man? Every didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why not every man? I set my foot on the gospel ship, and the ship began to sail. It landed me over on Canaan shore, and I'll never come back no more, back no more. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? lesson comes from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 32 to 37. Hear now the word of God. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money of the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone that had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprius, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I want to thank you for this opportunity from the bottom of my heart. I'm humbled for this chance. You see, I, I grew up here. This is my home church. It is so much a part of me. I was baptized here, went to Sunday school. I was confirmed here, very involved with the youth group. In fact, that's really where I first sent the, first sense the call to ministry. Carol and I were married right over there. On the second step there, I was ordained. What excites me so much though, this is the first time preaching for you. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Mark Morrison. Well, I'm actually Mark Keir Morrison. Have any of you not liked their names? Now I spoke with the two Kier families and they said 
it was all right for me to do this. I hated my middle name. How are you supposed to spell it? K-E-R? K-I-E-R, actually it is K-E-I-R. It took me until second grade to learn how to spell it correctly. And I was told that the Kears were some relatives who helped the family bridge building company get started. I was complaining to my brother Rob about it when he told me what the alternatives were. My mother wanted me to be Raymond Kier Morrison III. My dad said no. Rob said he wanted me to be Marcus Aurelius. If I can't spell Kier, there's no way in the world I was going to be able to spell Aurelius. So I guess my name is a compromise. I've also found out that my great-grandmother was Catherine Keir Morrison. They weren't just some relatives, but it was my great-grandmother's family. In fact, my great-great-grandparents worshipped here. And my great-grandparents have a window over there in the bank at back of the sanctuary. A name I hated for so long became one that I've learned to love. I named my son Alexander Keir Morrison, and he named his son Declan Keir Morrison. There are now five generations of Morrisons with Keir as their middle name. Ah, enough about me. Let's get to the Bible. A person's name carries great weight within the Bible, but in English we don't usually get it. In the Hebrew and the Greek, but particularly Hebrew uses a lot of play on words on people's names. Here are just a few if they're translated. Human, life giver, out of the river, exalted father, father of a multitude wrestles with God. And there's one story, ah, one book in the Bible. I just love the people's names. You get Pleasant, who is married to God as my king. Their children, listen to these names, are dying and wasting away. Later on, Pleasant says, don't call me Pleasant, but call me Bitter. And finally, and most important name, is the Lord will save us. Now for the translation. Human is Adam, life giver is Eve, out of the river is Moses, exalted father is Abram, Father of a multitude is Abraham, wrestles with God as Israel, and it's in the book of Ruth where God is my king is Elimelech. Naomi is pleasant. Melon is dying and Chilion is wasting away. But Naomi doesn't want to be called Naomi. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. And the Lord will save us is the name we're very familiar with. It doesn't sound right when you say the Lord will save us. But in Hebrew, it's Joshua. In Greek, it's Jesus. Until today's lesson, we hear about poor Isaac. Dying and wasting away have to be the worst, but Isaac can't be much better. But we know the story and have become accustomed to it. We're used to hearing that Isaac means he laughs. But today, I want you to put, be put into his spot. What would it be like to grow up with a name like he laughs? I hate to use this example, but it really gets the point across. It's coming to the end of the year, and it's the last junior high dance. The boys are all on one side of the gym, the girls are on the other. And you're on one side in the gym with your friends and across the floor you see you crush. You have liked her from afar, what seems like forever, but it's probably two weeks. You have never told her how you feel and you're not totally sure if she knows who you are. Your friends bolster you up. You are so scared walking across the gym, but you're doing it. It seems as if you're moving in slow motion. 
you get up to her and you can't even look her in the eyes. You look at your feet and you stammer out, whoa, 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 would you like to dance? And she says, yes. She gives her, you her name and asks, what's your name? You tell her, your name is He Laughs. Your crush and her friends explode into laughter. They're laughing so hard, your crush snorts. They're totally humiliated and run out of the gym fighting back tears. Now that's an example of what could happen if your name was He, he Laughs. And that's a hypothetical in the present time, but in the Bible, Isaac faced no such problems. He is, one of the, he is one of the foundations of the chosen people. God is often recognized as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac is one of those pillars of the Old Testament. But we've known his name and known his story so long. But that's certainly not true of our person from the New Testament lesson. It's particularly true if you use his real name. He's Joseph, not Jesus' father, but Joseph, the Levite. It still doesn't conjure up much. Joseph is a Levite from Cyprus. Uh, I guess we're going to need to identify him by his nickname. Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. In today's lesson, it's really an introduction to Barnabas. It's a short story. He took the land he owned and put it at the apostles' feet. And really, it's a setup story. It's set up for the story that follows, which is of Ananias and Sapphira. They sell their property, but don't give it all to the apostles. It keeps them back. And as a result, they die. Several weeks ago, we heard about the conversion of Paul. Here is a man who was trying to wipe out Christians from the face of the planet. Paul wanted to set up a holocaust for his day. He wanted every last Christian to die. And he was succeeding. He had permission to go to Damascus and carry out his hate. We know that he was converted and dramatically changed. But how was that received in first century Israel? People were asking, was his conversion real? Or was it just an act so people would receive him and then he would turn on them? When Paul returned to Jerusalem, nobody wanted anything to do with him. He was shunned, blackballed. However you want to describe it, he was isolated, pushed way to the side. But someone did see something in him. And of course, it was Barnabas. Barnabas listened to him, spent time with him, encouraged him. He even went as far as took Paul along with him to meet with the apostles. And Barnabas vouched for him. Imagine the courage it took for Barnabas to reach out to him. Until very recently, he was killing believers. The people who were still in power questioned his loyalties. That is Paul's loyalties. Somewhere, somehow, Barnabas saw something of value in him. He summoned up the courage and reached out to him and made connections with Paul. He took Paul with him before the disciples and vouched for him. And with some trepidation, the apostles accepted him. While Paul and Barnabas were on a missionary journey, there was a young man who wanted to go back to Jerusalem when things were going to get tough. Later on, when they were going on another missionary journey, this young man wanted to go with them. Barnabas said yes. Paul said no. This disagreement became so intense Barnabas and Paul split up. They went their separate ways. And Barnabas is not heard from again in the Bible. Now, who is this young man that caused so much trouble? 
His name is John Mark. Yes, the same John Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. In order to show how important that was, 90% of Mark appears in the Gospel of Matthew. 50% of it is in the Gospel of Luke. Most often, Barnabas is thought of as a minor character in the New Testament. But think of what would have happened if Barnabas did nothing. If Barnabas thought, let somebody else do it. No, it's not up to me. Let, let somebody more qualified do that. If he took that attitude, we may not be able to be here today. If there is no Barnabas, Paul's not brought before the apostles and approved. No missionary trips. And think of how much of the New Testament Paul wrote. Poof, it would be gone if Barnabas did nothing. If there's no Mark, it isn't just one of the Gospels taken out, but large chunks of the other two. Poof, they're gone. The very face of Christianity would be very different. Gentiles, which are us, may not be Christians. Our holy book, the Bible, would be a lot shorter. But Joseph of Cyprus saw a glimmer of something in these two men, and these two men changed history. The more I have looked at Barnabas' life, the more grateful I've become. The more I've learned about him, the more I want to become him. Several weeks ago, Reverend Eric Heinekamp preached and gave us an assignment. We were, take, we were to make a mission statement about our lives. I don't know about you, but I did that. Well, I cheated a little bit. I used a lyric from a song. In fact, it's the same song that Ed Schultz mentioned when he spoke about Pastor Craig's celebration. The song is, I Want to Live Like That by the Sidewalk Prophets. And my statement is, I want everything that I say and do to point towards you. Of course, that you is Jesus. I want my thoughts, my actions to be consistently showing my faith. I want the love of God bursting out of me the same way that joy is bursting out of me now. If you haven't done it yet, I'd like for you to develop the mission statement. I guess I should say I would encourage you to do it. Right now, I want you to take a moment and think of a person like Paul in your life. Someone who's an outsider, a person who doesn't fit in church, but would benefit, benefit greatly. And don't say all of your friends go to church. You know that's not true. Take a moment and think. Now I want you to think about your John Mark who is unsure of himself. Not sure what they should be doing, but has great potential. Grab your smartphones. Yes, I'm even asking you to grab your smartphone during a service and put those names in the notes. If you're at home, grab a pen and paper and do it. The most important thing though is once you have those names written, reach out to them. We need to reach out and encourage them. If we don't, who will? Remember Barnabas. What would the church be like without Paul and John Mark? What would the church be like if you don't include the people you thought of? We need to be a people who are accepting people as they are. We need to welcome people and greet them with a smile. We are doing this, but we can do more. We need to be a people who grow our spiritual life. And two, we need to be a people who know what their life, their Christian life is like. Develop that mission statement, live it out. Don't be satisfied with who you are, but become who you can be. All I want of us is to move to where we are 
to where Jesus wants us to be. Why am I saying this? I want to encourage you. After all, I am Mark Keir Barnabas Morrison. What's your name? <laughs>